tonight, the ex-wife of hometown rap star Eminem is accused of violating her probation tonight. It is related to Kim Mathers' drunk driving crash almost a year and a half ago. Kim Mathers briefly talking to Action News. New court documents show the ex-wife of rap superstar Eminem is being accused of violating her probation after drunk driving and crashing her SUV in Macomb Township in October of 2015. Right now, Metro is looking for more potential victims and a truly horrific crime. Detectives say the man you're looking at, Grant Claycomb, sexually assaulted his foster child, but police say he's also been a Boy Scout leader at his church for many years. He's also said to have cared for numerous other foster children. Inside a Burlington home, prosecutors say a domestic violence case took a strange twist. 45-year-old Darren Teat is accused of using Visine eye drops to spike his wife's soda, perhaps for weeks before she caught him doing it Sunday. It's outbreaking right now. Authorities are looking for three inmates who have escaped out of Lincoln County. Detectives say Brian Moody, Sonny Baker, and Mark Robbins escaped through a ventilation system last night. They were in jail for property crimes. Well, tonight, two teens are facing charges accused of raping a fellow student at Rockville High School. Montgomery County Police arrested 18-year-old Henry Sanchez and 17-year-old Jose Montano. The victim says she was walking down the hallway when both came up to her. Police say Montano asked her if she wanted to have sex. She said no, and that's when police say she was forced into the bathroom and raped. Sanchez and Montano face rape and sexual offense charges. So some building under construction caught fire and hopefully everyone in the adjacent buildings got out. That one building right there in the center is probably about 15 stories high. So. Uh, firefighters still out here, still working to put this fire out. We have all these firefighters coming in right now, ready to assist. At this point, we're not sure how long it's going to take. I mean, it looks like they might be out here for pretty well into the night. So we're going to uh, keep you updated as the situation develops on air and online. I'll send it back to you guys in the studio. Well, Kelly, before we leave you, I just want to get a sense. It's a five alarm fire. The firefighters are coming in by the bus load. Where are they coming from? Have you been able to get a sense of if they're being shipped from outside of Raleigh? I mean, at this point, we did try to speak with some people to see if they are bringing in any kind of outside agencies. But at this point, we've only seen Raleigh firefighters. But I didn't know we had so many firefighters in Raleigh because there's a lot of them. Actually, just down the block, they have a command station set up. So there's lots of firefighters, police, EMS, all set up in this parking lot just a little ways down from us. They wouldn't let us get that close with the camera. But lots of people coming out here ready to help. West Lawson Avenue is closed because of a sinkhole. This is near Buckingham Parkway. Crews are trying to fix the problem, but it's expected to take them several hours. You can see crews are out there right now. Another sinkhole happened recently in Studio City off of Laurel Canyon. So apparently this is something that's been more common lately. We're continuing to follow this story. Crews again monitoring the sinkhole on West Lawson Avenue in Culver City. You can see it right there. At about 11.15 this morning, uh, a body was located in, in Silver Lake. Near the uh, near the area of the of the dam and the over the the pass over there, uh, that that body was located approximately 400 feet 
from the area where the vehicle uh, entered into the into the water. Just, 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 just. You gotta help him. Yeah, yeah. Hold on, bro. We gotta move to the side. Yo, he, he's over. Oh, oh yo, an ambulance ran over this guy. Oh, 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 oh. Took his book bag and put it on. It's it started talking. That's what that yo, that's your book bag. Put it on. It's it started talking. That's what that They saw how he was bugging, so they stopped because they see he was dangerous to people. This nigga dropped the back to the end and put it in dry rain. Oh, oh, <coughs> and went over there. That's him down there, man. Because he saw him look in my eye. Oh. U.S. Central Command has confirmed it carried out a deadly airstrike in Syria. The strike took place on the border area between the Aleppo and Idlib provinces. According to eyewitnesses on the ground, over 50 people were killed as a result of an airstrike on a mosque in the area. Yeah. 
The target, they say, was a building where an Al-Qaeda meeting was taking place, but acknowledge the building was only 40 to 50 feet away from the mosque. A U.S. military official says, according to satellite imagery, the mosque was still standing after the strikes. Warplanes have violated the sanctity of God by striking one of the houses of God. In recent weeks, the U.S. military has ramped up its airstrikes targeting Al-Qaeda in the northern Idlib province. But activists say the majority of those killed Thursday were civilian worshippers. Syria experts warn Al-Qaeda may use the incident to gain more support in a part of the country where they've already been growing stronger. The Syrian military says four Israeli jets entered Syrian airspace from Lebanese airspace and struck a military site near Palmyra. The Israeli Air, <coughs> excuse me, the Israeli Air Force confirmed the strike but just said several targets were struck. In response, Syria fired anti-aircraft missiles at the Israeli jets, claiming they downed one and struck another one. The Israeli military says that's, quote, absolutely untrue and that no Israeli jets or civilians were hit by, uh, by the anti-aircraft fire. But one of those anti-aircraft missiles was taken down by Israel's Arrow missile defense system. That's the first time it's ever been used operationally since it was deployed some 20 years ago. The missile that was struck, that anti-aircraft missile, actually fell in Jordan, and we've seen pictures of that throughout the day. What's unusual about this is first that Israel acknowledged the airstrike. Israel very uh, rarely acknowledges reported airstrikes in Syria, though the prime minister said sometime last year that they have carried out multiple or dozens of airstrikes in Syria. This isn't the first time by any means that the Israelis have carried out their strikes in Syria. They've done it on dozens of occasions since the start of the war. It's normally been uh, to prevent weapons, uh, they say it's to prevent weapons being transferred to Hezbollah, uh, the Lebanese uh, uh, militant organization fighting in Syria alongside uh, Bashar Assad. And this reflects their concerns that Hezbollah is being emboldened by its participation in that war and that it could get hold of more sophisticated weapons uh, that it could then later uh, potentially use against uh, Israel. Also related to this is the broader sort of fear of, uh, of uh, Israel's that Iran is getting something of a strategic foothold inside Syria, not just through Hezbollah, who is strongly linked to them and supported by them, but also uh, because of their, Iran's own participation in, in the war. Uh, there's even been talk recently that uh, Iran would try uh, to, uh, to uh, a get a, a naval base in Syria uh, as a sort of quid pro quo uh, for the, for the uh, uh, support and assistance that they've given the Syrian government through the civil war. Well, Israeli jets in Syrian airspace is a clear violation of Syrian sovereignty. Um, so, yeah, it, I mean, that would seem illegal. But that said, a lot of countries have been violating Syrian airspace. There's so many countries that have been bombing Syria um, without, obviously, without being invited. As for Israel, though, you mentioned this is the third time. This is the third time that we know about. Um, Israel has been doing a lot of covert operations in Syria, sometimes like these bombing raids. This time it actually admitted to doing it. And when it does these bombing raids, it's not bombing al-Qaeda, it's not bombing ISIS, it's typically bombing Syrian, the Syrian army or, um, you know, press forces that are working with the Syrian army. And so that, by default, that benefits the people that the Syrian army is fighting, which is al-Qaeda and its various clones and ISIS. And specifically in Palmyra, there's been a back and forth between the Syrian army and ISIS there, you know, capturing and then losing and then recapturing um, areas of Palmyra from ISIS. And so by bombing, by bombing pro-Syrian army forces, you're, you know, that's de facto, you know, support, acting as air power for ISIS. And that's on top of what Israel's been doing in the Golan Heights, which has been to give actual material support to both um, al-Qaeda forces there as well as ISIS. And then also treating uh, fighters, jihadist fighters, in Israeli hospitals and then sending them back into battle in the Golan. And the reason for this is because 
Hezbollah is fighting ISIS and Al Qaeda, particularly in the Golan area. And Israel and its own um, officials have, have said this at various times, prefers Al Qaeda at its border to Hezbollah because it actually fears Hezbollah and sees them as an enemy, whereas it sees Al Qaeda as, for the time being at least, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, I guess. No, no more than we've seen civilians killed in Yemen or in Afghanistan or in Pakistan getting any justice. Um, it's just common practice, these apparently drone uh, strikes um, that, that target these uh, prominent jihadis. You will have collateral damage. The problem is that it was a prayer time um, and, and a lot of people would have been gathered or should have been expected to be gathering in that particular mosque. And we've seen images uh, coming out this uh, morning, actually, of, um, of the building and, and the targeted area or the targeted building is not 15 minutes away from the mosque. It seems to be part of the mosque compound. So, um, you know, probably people should have been more aware of what, what they're doing, but it's unlikely, going back to your question, that any civilian would get any justice out of this. هذا بإيد المجموعات مسلحة هذا هو الورق عملية تبعون تبعنا نحن هاي السبيلنا كانوا فين مسلحين؟ صار جيش. هون يعني هذا يعني نحن حط. أوكي. يعني قبل ما يكون في كما إلا قدام كانت هالسواتر تحمي الطريق تبعنا. يعني تعتبر أطراف كانت أغلبها أي شرقية. شرقية أوكي. كانوا فين مسلحين؟ It's questions. very strange. Uh, we have a, a minute or so left. And, and the one thing I wanted to, because it was another thing that I saw as strange, is between 1946 and 2001, there have been 220 armed conflicts around the world. And, uh, 140 of those were civil wars, 20 million casualties, 67 million displaced people. Mm. Those are just estimates. Um, since 2001, the US and its military allies have been fighting this war on terror and going in and we have these wars in already war-torn, fragile places. And in those places that are already struggling to survive, we haven't done a very good job at, we didn't have a good Marshall Plan for say Afghanistan. We didn't rebuild it in the right way. Uh, we're not taking care of 40 to 70% of people in those war zones they say are struggling with severe depression and post-traumatic stress disorders. Now, to bring it back around to the domestic policy, our domestic policies in the, in the US right now and what what the new administration is suggesting in these budgets seems a lot like 
our reconstruction of war zones where suddenly these little things are not important. It's certain things that we're going to spend all this money on a gas station. So is there any reason to believe that the same kind of actions that we've used to rebuild war zones is going to work here in the United States? Well, I, I mean, I was watching some of the debates uh, between Trump and, and, and Hillary Clinton, and Trump actually said if she had done nothing in Syria, we'd be better off. And that's before Trump was the imperialist that he said he wasn't going right. to be, um, which we knew he was going to be because he's yeah. a professional con artist. But he was right. Yeah. Now, look at the Brexit vote. 75% of people who voted for leave, to leave Brexit, said that immigration influenced them, and specifically the Syrian refugee crisis, which was exploited by Nigel Farage. This was also an issue that Trump exploited. There wouldn't be a Syrian refugee crisis if we hadn't helped fund a proxy war. If we hadn't invaded Iraq, there wouldn't have been ISIS and al-Qaeda in Syria. If we hadn't... Uh, reacted to 9-11 the way we did. There's also, what is the major disembarkation point for refugees to Europe? Libya is one of them. Why, had it, why did that happen? Gaddafi, yeah, bad guy. No, no I'm not going to disagree with it. He warned that there will be a massive refugee crisis if you remove me. NATO didn't listen, and now NATO is talking about sinking refugee ships. So this whole um, apparatus of the war on terror has moved Europe and the U.S. to the far right, and people think that Trump came out of a clear blue sky. No, he came out of the war on terror. Syria has claimed that acts of the U.S.-led coalition might lead to catastrophic consequences for population. The case is about strikes against dams on the river of Euphrates. Breach of dam will generate flooding of whole cities. Charge de Daffir of the Syrian delegation to the U.N. Munza Munza has sent an appropriate letter to the U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres as well as the Security Council. The diplomat has asked the organization to put pressure on the U.S. According to him, in a case dams are destroyed, life of hundreds of thousands of people will be under threat. The only source which supplies residents of the Aleppo, Raqqa and Deir Ez-Zor provinces with fresh water will be shut off. Secretary General of the Council of Europe, Torbjörn Jagland, also used to claim before that what was happening in Syria was the largest humanitarian catastrophe since the Second World War. <laughs> מתקדם לידי חיזבאללה. יש לנו את המודיעין, יש לנו את ההתכנות המבצעית, אנחנו פועלים למנוע את זה. זה מה שהיה וזה גם מה שיהיה. As really uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu promises to build a new settlement in the occupied West Bank. We are in talks with the White House and our intention is to reach an agreed policy for building settlements which is agreeable to us. Of course, this will help Israel after a period of many years during which we were not involved in such processes. Netanyahu made the announcement ahead of a meeting with Jason Greenblatt, U.S. President's uh, Special Envoy for the Middle East. He said that a new settlement will be built to replace the Amona outpost which was raised last month Meanwhile, Trump's special envoy earlier met with leaders of Israeli settler movement in Jerusalem outgoods in an unusual move that raises concerns over prospects of a solution to Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel's expansionist policy defies the United Nations Security Council resolution adop adopted uh, last December, which condemns settlements as a flagrant violation of international law. <laughs>
Now, the Secretary of Iran's Supreme National Security Council has said the U.S. and Saudi Arabia's supportive approach has helped terrorists expand their activities. Ali Shamkhani made the remark in response to Saudi Defense Chief Mohammed bin Salman's anti-Iran allegations during a meeting with his American counterpart, James Mattis, in Washington. Shamkhani said Washington and Riyadh have not made the least effort to fight terror. He described bin Salman as a novice whose, quote, worthless remarks are aimed at helping the Saudi regime avoid uh, accountability for its support of Takfiri terrorism. He added that Saudi Arabia's petrol dollars are spent on promoting hateful teachings and violence. I am sending Congress a budget that rebuilds the military and calls for one of the largest increases in national defense spending in American history. During an interview with CNN on Friday, Democratic Massachusetts Representative Seth Moulton, a member of the House Armed Services Committee, discussed remarks he made earlier in the week regarding a possible U.S. nuclear war with Russia. Moulton went on to criticize Donald Trump for not acting more forcefully against Russia for the country's violation of Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. The representative then raised the possibility of nuclear war with Russia should it use nuclear weapons against U.S. allies in Europe. Moulton then said, what if they target American troops, like the American troops who are training right now in Poland with a nuclear attack? What are we going to do and how quickly can that get out of control? U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley said in an interview that the United States should never trust Russia. Haley's statement was made as Senator John McCain accused Senator Rand Paul of working for Vladimir Putin when Paul questioned McCain on NATO. Earlier, I was joined by Senator Paul's father, former U.S. Representative Ron Paul, and I first asked him if we adhere to Haley's comments, could that undermine global security by placing a strain on U.S.-Russia relations? Well, I don't know about that, but I know it's going to cause mixed feelings here in, in this country uh, because uh, Trump was elected uh, w with a position he took that he wanted, you know, better relationships with, uh, with uh, Russia. Uh, she was appointed as a head diplomat for the United Nations, and that comes across as being very undiplomatic. Uh, so, no, it's, it, it's not a good way to start things off. I, I don't think it's uh, the end of uh, uh, relationship with Russia or anything like that, but uh, it, it seems like uh, she's either inexperienced or has a completely different position than Trump, or Trump has modified his position. So I think of it in more domestic uh, political terms as a, a bit of confusion, but uh, it certainly doesn't improve relationships with the, the U.S. and Russia when, uh, if we're starting off by saying we don't trust each other, but that generally is the case. You know, if you don't say it, most people, uh, you know, in most governments are really working on the assumption that they don't always trust each other. Even allies, uh, unfortunately, uh, spy on each other. So there's a little bit of that. But I would say symbolically and public relation wise, uh, this was not a very smart thing to say. Now, Dr. Paul, do you think that this could undermine uh, global security, especially when it comes to the fight against ISIS? 
Well, that's, that's hope not, uh, but coordination is pretty good. But I think policies, uh, our policies in Syria uh, otherwise are more significant. Uh, our sending more troops into Syria, I think, is uh, a much more serious thing than her making a, a blanket statement like she did, which wasn't, you know, the best thing in the world. But no, I think uh, troops being sent uh, into Syria right now is uh, what's going to undermine, uh, you know, these efforts. But uh, I'm not much into devising a strategy that some others want to do that we have to wipe out al-Qaeda al and ISIS because uh, I think that's, uh, uh, from my viewpoint, is overblown and that the more we make that our policy that we have to go in there and do those things, I think the greater danger that we're in. So I'd like us to back off and uh, allow uh, those people in Syria to deal with their own problems. Lots of people coming out here ready to help. West Lawson Avenue is closed because of a sinkhole. This is near Buckingham Parkway. Crews are trying to fix the problem, but it's expected to take them several hours. You can see crews are out there right now. Another sinkhole happened recently in Studio City off of Laurel Canyon. So apparently this is something that's been more common lately. We're continuing to follow this story. Crews again monitoring the sinkhole on West Lawson Avenue in Culver City. You can see it right there. At about 11.15 this morning, uh, a body was located in, in Silver Lake near the, uh, near the area of the, of the dam, the, over, the, the pass over there. Uh, that, that body was located approximately 400 feet from the area where the vehicle uh, entered into the, into the water. Just, just, just. You gotta help him. Yo, yo, yo. Hold on, bro. We gotta move to the side. Yo, he, he's over. Oh, oh yo, an ambulance ran over this guy. Oh, oh get up and get the wall. Took his book bag and put it on. It's it started talking. That's all that. Yo, that's your book bag. Yeah. Put it on. It's it started talking. That's all that. Yo, that's your book bag? He was like, yeah. Then he jumped in the ambulance, the, 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 the thing truck. Oh, and and because they saw how he was bugging, so they stopped because they see he was dangerous to people. This nigga jumped back. Put the ambulance in the air, then put it in drive. Hallway, when both came up to her, police say Montano asked her if she wanted to have sex. She said no, and that's when police say she was forced into the bathroom and raped. Sanchez and Montano face rape and sexual offense charges. So some building under construction caught fire and hopefully everyone in the adjacent buildings got out. That one building right there in the center is probably about 15 stories high. So.
Uh, firefighters still out here, still working to put this fire out. We have all these firefighters coming in right now, ready to assist. At this point, we're not sure how long it's going to take. I mean, it looks like they might be out here for pretty well into the night. So we're going to uh, keep you updated as the situation develops on air and online. I'll send it back to you guys in the studio. Well, Kelly, before we leave you, I just want to get a sense. It's a five alarm fire. The firefighters are coming in by the bus load. Where are they coming from? Have you been able to get a sense of if they're being shipped from outside of Raleigh? I mean, at this point, we did try to speak with some people to see if they are bringing in any kind of outside agencies. But at this point, we've only seen Raleigh firefighters. But I didn't know we had so many firefighters in Raleigh because there's a lot of them. Actually, just down the block, they have a command station set up. So there's lots of firefighters, police, EMS, all set up in this parking lot just a little ways down from us. They wouldn't let us get that close with the camera. But tonight, the ex-wife of hometown rap star Eminem is accused of violating her probation tonight. It is related to Kim Mather's drunk driving crash almost a year and a half ago. Kim Mathers briefly talking to Action News. New court documents show the ex-wife of rap superstar Eminem is being accused of violating her probation after drunk driving and crashing her SUV in Macomb Township in October of 2015. Right now, Metro is looking for more potential victims and a truly horrific crime. Detectives say the man you're looking at, Grant Claycomb, sexually assaulted his foster child, but police say he's also been a Boy Scout leader at his church for many years. He's also said to have cared for numerous other foster children. Inside a Burlington home, prosecutors say a domestic violence case took a strange twist. 45-year-old Darren Teat is accused of using Visine eye drops to spike his wife's soda, perhaps for weeks before she caught him doing it Sunday. It's outbreaking right now. Authorities are looking for three inmates who've escaped out of Lincoln County. Detectives say Brian Moody, Sonny Baker, and Mark Robbins escaped through a ventilation system last night. They were in jail for property crimes. Well, tonight, two teens are facing charges accused of raping a fellow student at Rockville High School. Montgomery County Police arrested 18-year-old Henry Sanchez and 17-year-old Jose Montano. The victim says she was walking down the